If you grew up in the 90s or early 2000s, you're probably familiar with these. The CRT. Often weighing upwards of 200 pounds, these consumer sets were found in just about every household around the world. During this era, CRTs were produced in a wide range of styles. From plastic housings to flat-faced models and wood-paneled cabinets, they all shared one defining trait. They rendered video game images in a way that modern screens are simply unable to replicate. Rather than relying on a fixed grid of pixels like contemporary flat panels, CRTs drew each frame line by line using an electron beam that swept across a phosphorescent screen. The result was something fundamentally different, soft, analog, and full of subtle imperfections. Developers at the time didn't just work around these traits, they utilized them. Dithering became gradients, harsh pixel edges faded into shape, transparency was often faked using patterns that only blended correctly on the CRT. This wasn't just a workaround, it was part of the art. Today's modern displays are brilliant in many ways. Deep contrast, pixel perfect sharpness, instant response, and if you're using an OLED, you get those inky blacks that make modern media look exceptional. But feed a signal from a classic console into one of these displays and everything falls apart. The image is too raw and clinical. Effects that were once hidden or blended now stand out in ways they were never meant to. The image no longer holds together as a cohesive visual experience. In essence, the illusion is gone and the art breaks. Part of the problem lies in how modern displays handle legacy signals. TVs today simply weren't built with 240p or 480i in mind. I mean, they can show the image, sure, but they don't interpret it the way a CRT would. You end up with improper scaling, mismatched aspect ratios, and high latency from aggressive processing. The results can certainly vary depending on the TV, but generally, it's not good. The image can look warped, shimmery, or overly sharp in all the wrong places. You'll sometimes get strange deinterlacing artifacts, or even a frame of input lag. Just enough to throw off the muscle memory you built as a child. And this is arguably where things fall apart the most. It's not just that it looks different, it also feels different. The games feel wrong, and for anyone chasing that original experience, this is where the disconnect begins. So. If today's modern displays are unable to faithfully handle these old signals, what's the solution? And, more importantly, how do we preserve the way these games were meant to be seen and felt? The artist's original intent. That is where the RetroTINK 4K comes in. The RetroTINK 4K is the latest creation from Mike Chi, an engineer and developer who's quietly become one of the most important figures in retro video preservation. Over the past several years, he's released a range of devices under the RetroTINK moniker, starting with affordable plug-and-play scalers and gradually evolving into more advanced video processors like the RetroTINK 5X Pro, which over the years has become a go-to solution for retro enthusiasts. Mike's 4K iteration of the RetroTINK builds on everything that came before it, but pushes even further by leaning into the capabilities of today's most advanced displays. As the latest entry in the TINK line, it boasts full analog input, native 4K output, 
and the kind of image customization that simply wasn't possible until displays like modern OLEDs made high fidelity CRT simulation a reality. It's not just about getting the image on the screen, it's about presenting it with the kind of precision, softness, and motion characteristics that reflect how these games were originally designed to appear. And when dialed in, the results can be absolutely stunning. This level of visual precision is only possible thanks to the RetroTink's incredibly deep suite of settings. Far beyond simple scaling or filter options, it lets you adjust everything from scanline density, beam shape and color bleed, to convergence alignment, horizontal blur simulation, and visual characteristics that mimic phosphor glow. It's the kind of control that lets you fine tune the image down to the subpixel. Not only does it make it look good, but more importantly, makes it look right. What separates the RetroTINK 4K most isn't just its level of compatibility or output resolution, it's the flexibility it offers in how the image is crafted and presented. Now that's not to say you have to build everything from scratch. In fact, the RetroTINK community has created an entire library of presets, profiles designed to mimic everything from professional broadcast monitors and arcade displays to softer, more familiar look of the CRTs people grew up with. All the more exciting is that these profiles can just be treated as starting points. Each profile gives you a solid foundation which can then be tailored to match the exact feel you're going for. Maybe you want to introduce a bit of horizontal blur to soften the raw digital edge of a preset, or maybe you want to bring in scan lines and tweak their intensity, or give the colors a softer, more nostalgic look. You can adjust all of it until it lines up with how you remember that specific game looking. And that's the beauty of the RetroTINK 4K. It doesn't lock you into someone else's version of Authentic, it gives you the tools to shape your own. When it comes to my personal setup, in most cases, I'm running my original consoles through the RetroTINK into my LG C10. While I do still own a basic consumer grade Sylvania CRT for when I'm feeling particularly nostalgic, I tend to prefer playing my retro games on the LG these days. The image just looks cleaner overall and with higher end S video and component cables, I'm able to reach a level of fidelity that my CRT just doesn't have the inputs to match. And yeah, while this video is largely a love letter to original CRTs, I must emphasize that the RetroTINK gets you so close to the look of an actual CRT, in most cases I don't feel the need to go back. And honestly, I'm not sure I could give a stronger endorsement than that. As for my preferred settings, I've built a dedicated profile set up for each individual console I own, tailored to that system's specific signal and overall feel. For example, my N64 running through S-Video is based on one of the community presets. From there, I've added scan lines, a touch of modulation, and a bit of horizontal blur to help smooth out the geometry without over softening the image. Personally, I think it looks fantastic. I had some friends over recently to play a few N64 games, and before we even powered on the console, one of them who understood how these games are supposed to look commented that it probably looks pretty rough on a modern TV. But once the game loaded, their reaction flipped completely. In fact, they said it was the best they'd ever seen the N64 look, and that stuck with me, because it meant that the effort to dial it in wasn't just working for me, it was landing for someone else too. On the other end of the signal spectrum is my PS1 running over composite, which is effectively one of the worst signals you can feed into a modern TV. But the retro tank gives me the tools to lean into it instead of fighting it. For this, I'll typically add a healthy dose of horizontal blur, introduce color bleed, and sometimes enable pseudo interlacing to better mimic the flicker you'd see on a CRT. 
It makes a huge difference, and honestly, I thoroughly enjoy the way it looks. Next, we have the analog pocket, which I run through the tank via HDMI. Since the pocket outputs a clean 1080p signal through its dock, I'm essentially feeding the RetroTank a perfect image that it then upscales to 4K. From there, I can add scan lines, slot masks, or even dial in slight color shifts to simulate how NES or SNES would have looked on consumer CRT sets. The NES in particular really benefits from this. The profile I've built is a clear and intentional departure from its natural HDMI output. It adds a healthy dose of that CRT character and feels more in line with how I remember the system at its best. And, as blasphemous as it may be, the Tink even gives you the option to stretch 4x3 content up to 16x9. I wouldn't recommend it, but hey, that's your prerogative and I'll only judge you silently from afar. When it comes to my favorite retro setups, the PlayStation 2 over component is easily at the top of the list. In games like Burnout 3, which remains one of my favorites to this day, Holding triangle and X during boot enables 480p progressive scan mode. The difference is immediate. The image looks sharper, more stable, and holds up beautifully even during high speed action. It's a simple enhancement, but one that makes a big impact on a game that already looks gorgeous and runs at a breakneck pace. The PS2 library still includes so many more of my all time favorites Metal Gear Solid 2. Silent Hill 2, Soul Calibur 2, that's a lot of 2s, and Eco, which is a bit of an edge case. Most PS2 games output in 480i or 480p when supported, but as one of the earlier titles on the system, Eco runs natively at 240p. Because of that, it pairs remarkably well with one of the CRT model emulation profiles available through the RetroTINK's SD card. You get smooth edges, slightly softened motion, and just enough visual texture to make everything feel more cohesive, more in line with how this game was intended to be experienced. For this reason, I keep a dedicated profile just for Eco. It's not the most convenient solution, but for a game with such a distinct visual identity, it's totally worth it. And truth be told, it's one of my most satisfying profiles I've managed to dial in. At the time of this recording, there are two versions of the RetroTINK 4K available. The CE, which stands for Consumer Edition, is a more affordable alternative relative to the Pro model at around $475 US dollars. Functionally, the CE and Pro are identical when it comes to CRT simulation, but the Pro does add a few extra features like more advanced motion adapted the interlacing, including inverse telecine, as well as rotation support for vertical tape displays. Still, for most setups and users, the CE delivers the same core experience at a significantly lower price. And, considering the cost of building a setup from individual components that could even approach this level of quality, the all-in-one nature of the tank starts to feel like a value, even at a premium. For me, the RetroTINK 4K isn't just hardware. It's a restoration toolkit. It allows these games and their signals to be displayed with the care they were designed for. And, when everything is dialed in, when every blur, bleed, scan line, and beam profile clicks into place, it goes beyond being accurate. It comes alive, not just in the way it looks, but in the way it feels to play again, as if you're seeing it the way it was always meant to be.